I'm spooling up. All right, we are live on the Teacher's Lounge. We're going to wait for some guys to jump in and jump on. For those of you watching on Facebook, I would encourage you to jump on the link on YouTube if you want your comments read and you want us to know who you are. Otherwise, it's difficult to find out who you are through um, through the face, Facebook. Facebook groups are no longer showing who the individual is, just so that you know. Um, so we're going to wait for some more people to jump on. We haven't even got anybody on. I don't know why. Oh, we got two viewers. You know, so it looks like we're up to, there we go. We can start the teacher's lounge and here we go. So I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for the teacher's lounge. We've got a very special show tonight. We've got Jim sitting right next to me right over here. He is going to talk to us a little bit tonight about color sealing, and he has been in the cleaning field for quite some time, has a lot of experience. How are you doing tonight, Jim? I have so many issues here, yeah, but I think you said, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. Yeah, how are you doing? Doing well. You're doing good. Awesome. Kevin, how are you doing tonight? Everybody knows the sleeveless wonder, masterful sleeveless master. I'm doing better tonight than I was today. Today sucked. It was a Monday all day, and that is a whole another show we can talk about. But maybe it's next week's over show now. we can go into bad days because we've all had them. So we need to talk about bad days and how to get over that. But anyways, it looks like Robert Quinn's directly underneath me. How are you doing tonight, Robert? Absolutely phenomenal. Another day in paradise. Excellent. So we have Paul right over here. In this corner right there, how are you doing tonight? How did the rug washing show go in training? It went great. They get better each time. They had a very nice school. Lots of cool rugs to clean. Lots of uh, we had we had a student from um, New Zealand. I think that's the furthest anybody's traveled to come to one of those. We had a guy from Australia had the record before. Uh, somebody from Alaska. Uh, people from uh, Canada. Uh, and then people all over the Midwest, so and uh, the West Coast. So ni nice uh, audience, and uh, we had a great time. Everything went well. That sounds awesome. I wish I could have been there with you guys and gotten to jump in and join in that fun. But we're all so busy, can't do everything. But I would encourage anybody that's watching to jump on the Rug Room. They have shows every Wednesday night. And maybe see what their classes are all about and how to get an Oriental rugs because that's an entirely different thing than what we do here. So let's go ahead and get right into the what would you do segment. Aaron, would you mind jumping on in? All right. So this guy is asking how to clean this type of floor and just a white pad. So can we blow that picture up a little bit? So obviously it's some sort of planking floor i can't tell through the photo if it is vinyl planking i think it is because it's got a little bit of a turned down edge i don't think it's ceramic i don't know it's hard to tell um how would you clean this kevin well it kind of looks like some type of lvt or engineered wood um I'm trying to picture's a little hard to see it doesn't look like it really has i don't know if those are actual seams or um, exactly what that is. But obviously, you want to be a little bit careful with how much water you put down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of times, those clean up really, really well. I've used even red pads on them and, and yeah. not had any issues with the finish. Don't put any type of sealer on it. They're not meant to have it on there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, all in all, that looks like it should be a pretty easy clean. Uh, looks like there's some film on it, which could be some soap residue from the, the homeowner. Hopefully, it's not a sealer residue that they put on there, because then you're talking about a whole another process. But yeah, I don't, I don't think this is going to re require a strip and refinish. But that's why you always test everything. If you guys don't know how to test flooring, you're going to want to um, look into a hard surface class, like what Mike Coyote has, and um, like what, uh, like what. Uh, Tom Cermak may be able to help you find a class, but with this type of flooring, 
you're going to want to test it first, a little floor stripper, make sure there's no finish on there, a high pH degreaser, for example, something like that, but in a discrete corner because you don't know what's going on, especially if this is um, a, a laminated pressed style um, faux wood. You know, if it's, it's a, if it's L, if it's a laminate, you're probably pretty good if it's vinyl. But if mm -hmm. it's not vinyl, you know, it could be an MDF back and then that will swell really bad and really quick. And then you can have pop corners and edges and then it's your problem. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to chime in on this? What would you do? Robert? Kind of looks like, you know, just from blowing it up a little bit, kind of looks like there's some streaking, maybe mop streaking. What they've used, <sighs> Fabuloso, Pinesol, Bona any of the any of the products that homeowners buy um this looks like to me at this and this is real uh real commonplace now in all of the new homes coming up in north texas mm -hmm. uh, it looks like that you know that pressed wood uh fiber backed the fiber board um a lot of times when the cleaning ladies come in to, to do a final post-construction clean. They'll use something like Bona or Fabulosa or something like that and just smear stuff around. So typically we'll use a stripper or a dissolver in a corner somewhere, see what it is. Most times it comes right up. You might put a little bit of a dissolver down, high pH or a neutral cleaner, white pad, done. Super yeah, simple. And I think this might have been the individual too. It says... Just mop by dirty grime all over the place. Yeah, and so it might be as simple as hold just on, cleaning it with on. a white scrubbing pad and giving it a light rinse. Um, you know, and a lot of times what I've seen in a janitorial field is, um, and, and certainly homeowners as well, just from not knowing, but the majority of the time you get streaks and film on a floor, it's either dirty mop or dirty mop water. You know, I remember having a building that we cleaned it with. It had black pearl granite in the entryway. And right. Of course, this is in Michigan, Michigan winter. So guess what happens to black pearl granite in the middle of winter? And every time that we would have an issue, I'd go in and train, and it was simply mopping correctly. So sometimes you had to flood mop and then pick that up or wet mop and then damp mop behind it, clean water, clean mop. I don't it might be surprised what happens if you just clean it the right way. Yeah, I'm curious, Paul. Now you you have a lot of experience, and I know you've had customers approach you and say, "What kind of coating should I put down?" Um, can you tell us what you would tell those people that want to put a coating down on this type of floor? Well, well typically it has a factory coating, uh, and from just a picture like this, it's it's hard to really know. But uh, if you're asking questions on a floor like this, if you can get uh, more information on what it really is or who manufactured it, or even a side view uh, of what the floor looks like, uh, maybe a, a piece that wasn't installed, then, mm -hmm. then that makes all kinds of uh, differences. But a lot of these uh, manufactured uh, floors have a factory finish. And the last thing you want to do is add a finish on top then some floors have a finish that's put on that's temporary, that's only supposed to be there until it's installed. And then those you want to take off and, and put a new finish down. But I, I really can't make those uh, judgment calls without knowing what this is um, and, and who made it or how it was made. Because uh, a lot of them look very similar, but you might have a, a impregnated a wood floor that, really will wear like iron that could go into a mall mm -hmm. or an airport or a public building and last for years and years and years. And then you get a basically a particle board floor with a photograph of wood on it and the thing won't hold up at all to heavy traffic. So uh, I just don't know enough about looking at it uh, without knowing, you know, what to do. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's what I wanted to say. I was hoping you would go there. Thank you so much for that answer. I, I really think that with this type of flooring, um, one of the biggest disservices you can do as a company to for a customer is put a coating on it without knowing what the manufacturer wants you to do. Because a lot of these planking floorings that are coming out, 
um, and that are really just particle board with a picture on it, you put a finish on it. Now, all of a sudden, all the edges and corners are going boop. And then you own that floor because well, it can soak up all that. And Thomas has his hand up. Thomas. And there are actually special finishes. If you know the manufacturer, they may recommend there are some two-part finishes that will bond much better. They actually heat up and bond to the floor, whereas a single coating type product may not adhere well at all. Mm -hmm. So you really need to know what the floor is to begin with and then talk with wherever you're buying your supplies from and say, hey, I have an XYZ floor and I'm looking to put a finish on it. And he may say, hey, well, if you use A or B product, it won't work. But C is this two-part product. Some of the new sort of oh, like off coating, you put the second one on, it heats to accelerate, smooths it all out. And it bonds and it makes as thick in millimeters a coating as the original floor coating and does a tremendous Absolutely. job. So Paul's exactly right. You have to know what you're dealing with to do it well. And I know a lot of people buy different brands that are one coat supposed to fix everything. But I have seen some very problematic floors where those coatings didn't adhere well or didn't have the durability. They looked great when they were applied. Don't get me wrong. They looked fantastic. Six months later, the customer is saying, well, obviously that didn't work and putting another floor again. So, right. You know, do your homework. Uh, investigation. You know, it's great to have an answer, even if it's the wrong one. But if you do your homework and you can give the customer the right answer, that's where you really take home the box. Well, they'll pay more money for it and they'll be a lot happier. Absolutely, Thomas. I 100% agree and concur. In fact, you know, you guys that are watching this on YouTube, go out and and on Facebook, go out to your local home improvement store like Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, whatever you have, and go to their flooring section and grab as many of those little sample tags as you can. Then take your favorite coating product and test it on a little corner of that and see how it holds up. You'll find out some of these floors that are, this is not one of them. Because I, I don't see the grid pattern, but it's also not quite enhanced enough. But um, some of those floorings are now um, aluminum oxide coated, but they also have a built-in polymer Teflon coating. And nothing will adhere. I mean, nothing. Like, they're like trying to glue to a frying pan. So just, just keep in mind, you don't know unless you test and test and test and test. And all these floorings are free. There's free samples of all of them at your local home improvement store. Grab up a thousand of them, test them, see what it's like. Do the same with carpet, by the way. Okay, well, we covered this subject pretty darn golden. Let's move on to the next, what would you do? All righty, so, um, oh man. So this guy had a pretty big spill of laundry detergent. I think we all know that everybody's gonna say online just to use a ton of, ton of defoamer and rinse the snot out of it, but it goes a little beyond that. I'm curious, what would you do, Kevin? Well, you're going to need some defoamer for sure. And anytime I've done anything with laundry detergent, it's it's about flushing it. So I'm not worried about PSI. If you're using a wand that has really small jets and you're blasting uh, a lot of PSI, I'd rejet your wand and, and just make as much Tentful. flow as you possibly can without agitating what's on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you got to be careful with over wetting, but I've even poured water on the carpet just to be able to pull that as much of that soap out as, as you can, because if you don't get it all out, it's mm -hmm. just going to start attracting soil. So less PSI, more GPM is what you would need in a situation. That's what I would do in this situation. Oh, I absolutely agree. Paul. The one thing, uh, the one common mistake that is made here is people put their anti-foam or defoamer right on the carpet. And that's really a mistake. Uh, most of those products are uh, silicone based mm -hmm. and that silicone is going to attract soil. Um, and it's just it just is not necessary. All you need to do is add your defoamer into your tool or into your hose. Now you can add it into your tank on your machine, but your your hose will foam up. And uh, 
affect the performance of your machine. So if you just take like a cap full and, and put it in the lips of your extraction tool or take the hose cuff off and, and pour a little bit into the, uh, the hose cuff, then you're not applying that product uh, to the textile itself. There's even some powdered products that as a carpet inspector, uh, they go and um, see a carpet that has uh, polka dots all over it. From where people have broadcast that uh, dry defoamer onto the carpet, thinking because it's dry, it's not going to affect uh, the textile. Mm -hmm. So that would be my suggestion is to um, uh, avoid putting the anti-foam uh, onto the carpet or upholstery itself. Um, some get, there's these, even some gadgets the, that inject it into your hose uh, by uh, like, a, like a proportion or valve. And th those are cool too, if you have one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one other little trick that works, e even though you think it wouldn't, but those urine blocks uh, that, that you use for deodorizing a urine that are like little cakes, urine cakes, uh, urine mints, don't eat the mint. Uh, actually, those are usually silicone um, and cationic surfactant. And uh, uh, tossing one of, those, one of those into your portable um, is actually a pretty good way to keep the tank from um, foaming up too much. I, I throw one in my truck mount tank and, you know, a little trick. Um, Thunder actually works really good at killing foam. It works crazy good. In fact, we've had a lot of reports of guys using um, Thunder as their alkaline rinse when they're cleaning up foam. The nice thing about Thunder is it's got a little bit of a solvent in it and that'll help break down some stuff and it can also help saponify some of those uh fats if there's any i mean some of those uh well let's face it if it's a if it's a fabric softener it can help gather some of that and help remove it from the carpet but start out with just water just water um and don't add a ton of defomer don't add defomer to your carpet that's a no-no um, i'm curious does anybody else have anything they would like to jump in and say sure oh jim Oh, just real quick with the defomer thing, um, how we're talking about it, powders versus liquids and things like that. But I did notice I like powder myself, but with the liquid, um, one thing that we got, especially with our portable guys, is we would get like a tile and grout sponge and put it on the tile and grout sponge and soak it in that and then drop it into the tank. Uh, but Absolutely. also like you guys were talking about with the pucks, I know John Don's selling those now too, uh, the deodorizer pucks that are similar to the urine cakes that you can drop right in as well. But those work, they don't work great unless you break them up. Those ones specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you, Jim. I've, I've played with those pucks and I actually think they work really, they perform really well. I do like to break them up. I use a, I use a ball peen hammer right in the center of them. It breaks them up normally into four or five pieces, scatter them in your recovery tank on your truck mount fixes it. And with um, the, with the portable, we use the little sock filters. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would break a little piece off and stick it inside the sock filter instead of inside the tank. Oh, that's brilliant. That's a great yeah. idea. I mean, I learned something new. I never even thought of that. I never even thought of putting one in my sock filter. I mean, yeah. my goodness, I feel like an idiot all of a sudden. I thought you, I thought you knew everything, Beaker. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to stay calm, Kevin. I mean, come on, man. Be nice to me. Be nice. <laughs> How about no? How about no? Okay. <laughs> you know we're friends because you can pick on me, right? Um, yes, I do. So uh, it looks like Thomas has something he would like to share. Well, if you're going to use the liquid defoamers, like Paul said, put it down the lips of your wand. I keep mine in a spray bottle, and I spray it down the lips of the wand. It defoams the wand, the hoses, and then the machine as it reaches to it. And if you're proactive, if you know if it's cutting off every three minutes instead of running back to your truck or your machine and pouring in the tank, every two minutes, flip the end of the wand up, spray some deep warmer down the end, and then put it back down on the floor. Okay. The other thing is uh, Kevin made a great point in that it's more about flushing and volume than pressure. Pressure will create foam. So you may just take something as simple as a water cloth 
and a low pressure hose like your uh, auto dump out hose, a garden hose, and a yep. little shut up, and you could actually flush, being careful not to saturate, and of course testing to make sure you know pull up a vent or whatever, see what kind of floor you're dealing with. But you could actually flush that way carefully around the edges of a water claw and flush it all out without creating all the foam and all the problems by using low pressure and cold water. So and adding solvents to that. And there's a number of there's a million different ways, but low pressure flushing to a water claw is good. Never put any silicon base, like Paul said, on the carpet causes rapid resoiling and uh, can actually in some cases with some of those silicones discolor the carpet. But the rapid resoiling is the big thing. You never flush that out. Yeah, and and on the liquid defoamer, one thing that I do, and it, it works great, go to like uh, Gordon Food Service and get the condiment bottles that have the squirt top on them. Put your liquid in there, and then every so often you just tip your wand up and you literally just squirt it in there like it's a ketchup. And, and it starts coating the inside of your hose. Easy way to do it. If you drop it, it's not going to spill all over the place, and you don't have to carry a gallon jug around with you. Yeah, and I found a good source for defoamer. If you guys are like – out of defoamer and you can't go to your local service company and you need defoamer and you need it now tractor supply co has it on the shelf for agricultural it's probably the best product the farm field defoamers they're made to defoam thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of gallons they even make it that's designed to handle those uh, maceration bladders which look for those of you that don't know that's where they take all the hog poop and all the cow poop and they put them in a baggie and they pull off the methane and those get a ton of foam in them. And the way they do that is they'll actually throw some, um, some in there. Um, that sounds like a really crappy job though. Yeah. Well, we actually got a question yeah. from a viewer. Is there, is there any difference between LST and silver solution? And actually there is um, silver solution has more um, fluorocarbons in it. Um, Paul's right here, and Paul can describe a little bit better, I'm sure. Well, well, yes, that, that's um, the most expensive ingredient in LST is the fluorocarbon surfactant. It's extremely expensive. Fluorocarbons, mm -hmm. fluorocarbons are just they're just expensive. Uh, very difficult mm -hmm. to make. Uh, they're about a thousand dollars a pound for a pure. Uh, floral carbon. So um, that's an expensive ingredient. But, you know, when I was talking to Tim, you know, how can, how can we make things better? How can we get better performance? You know, how can we get the maximum uh, results? And so that was my suggestion was to increase uh, the amount of floral carbon surfactant. Uh, and that makes it perform very, very well. Um, you know, when you make a surfactant, one end of the molecule, the working end of the molecule, the molecule end that loves water uh, is at one end. And then mm -hmm. the other end of the molecule is something that hates water. And that's what makes yes. surfactants and detergent work. Mm -hmm. What thing on the world can you have that hates water more than waterproofing? And that's what these fluorocarbons are. They're waterproofing agents. So if you can make a surfactant molecule where one end loves water and the other end absolutely hates it more than anything else, then you have a much better performing uh, surfactant or detergent. And that's what uh, Silver Solution is. Yeah, it's just, it's a high performance. It's a very high performance product. The price is, there's a good reason behind the price is because of the amount of the fluorocarbons that's in it and the research behind it and development that we put into it. So let's move on to the next, what would you do? Um, this is from my good friend from Hawaii and he had a two part question. Um, why should customers not use store-bought spotters? So who wants to cover that one guys? That could be an hour-long show for Paul on its own. Couldn't I think. that be <laughs> Paul? Please. <laughs> yes. Well, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the over-the-counter spotters uh, break the rules uh, for the chemistry we use on uh, carpeting, and it's because um, 
the people that make them, you know, really don't know the carpet industry. Now they might be okay for some hard surfaces, uh, but you know, that's that really my attention on textiles. Uh, for example, one that's very, very common, uh, especially in laundry products, which a lot of these bigger companies make, uh, is optical brighteners. And, and that's just a example. Well, when you wash a garment, uh, you know, a lot of people wear a garment one time, you know, pair of socks, pair of underwear, uh, maybe a shirt, and they wear it once, even maybe for an hour or two, and then they throw it in their dirty clothes and wash it. So mm -hmm. if you're putting some uh, product in there that's going to uh, deteriorate over time or cause trouble over time, well, you're going to wash it every you know, few hours that it's in use. Well, then you can get away with certain things like, for example, optical brighteners. But if you put an optical brightener that's made for laundry uh, into a carpet spotter, uh, then you're going to have uh, a dye that's really phosphorescent dye you'll be adding dye to your carpeting and that dye because it's meant to be temporary not to last for years a lot of times will just color generally turn yellow would be the answer to that also because the uh, phosphorescent dyes the optical dyes that are used for optical brightener they'll cause a color shift and again generally a yellow shift but if you have like a blue carpet and you put uh, optical brighteners, you're going to get a green shift. And that's mm -hmm. how color theory works. So for, that's just one example is how uh, these spotters can really be bad on carpet and upholstery. Because we're not going to launder that upholstery, you know, every time we use it. It's going to go months or years. And then I'll get one other real quick example because it's such a problem. A lot of these spotters um, basically have oxidation in them. A lot of them have um, hydrogen peroxide. A lot of them have um, uh, sodium percarbonate or some other product that is an oxidizer. And a lot of them advertise on TV, you know, oxy clean, oxy this, oxy that. Well, yeah. again, very, very destructive uh, to some of the dyes that we use, especially uh, natural dyes uh, and, um, you know, dyes that are made for natural fibers. And again, the, the people that are trying to make a countertop cleaner or a bathroom cleaner or an all-purpose cleaner, they're not thinking about some of the fine textiles that people have in their homes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's oftentimes I'll get a, it, like oxy clean is i'm glad you brought that up because i was actually thinking about that that product actually has both optical brighteners in it and sodium percarbonate and sodium percarbonate is there any way to give yourself a calculated number toward the percentage and volume of peroxide once it's mixed up and the answer is frankly no there's no way of getting that definite percentage number um from scoops because it's a variance and it's varied throughout the product. It's also mixed with sodium carbonate. And so you don't know how much peroxide is in it, but you know, their infomercial looks terrific. Um, but then the question arises and I, does anybody else have anything to chime in when it comes to the brighteners or when it comes to the spotters? I the, think the only other thing I'll add is you, you want to keep in mind that anything that store bought is I, I use for lack of a better term, dumbed down. Yeah. Because Menards doesn't want people suing them because they ruined something. So yeah, when you buy, let's say, you know, a um, bathroom cleaner. Yeah, it's an acid cleaner, but it's probably not 14% phosphoric or it's probably not 9% hydrochloric. They need to be safe and not have people hurt themselves or hurt a surface that's going to cause them problems. So a lot of times that's why when you get even outdoor grade bleach from the store, it's like 6%. In soft wash, we use 12.5%. So, but you don't want to give that to a homeowner. So there's there's just not the same level of chemistry that's there that you can get in a professional product for mainly liability reasons. Yeah. Um, Paul? That, that's an excellent point. Most of household products we would call watered down, not professional strength. 
But having said that, the thing that that freaks me out is some of the household products are absolutely way, way too powerful. Yes. Uh, for example, I, I think there's a product out there called Kaboom. Yeah. And I think that Kaboom has hydrochloric acid in it. Yes. If I remember right, you know, a muriatic right. acid, many people call it. And that stuff will absolutely destroy all kinds of things like uh, metal, for example. Uh, and, and a countertop. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's terrible. And then you can buy things like hydrofluoric acid at, at the grocery right. store. And, and that's an extremely aggressive acid, but yet it's there. So only thing I can think of is, you know, you go to one of these superstores, you know, they say, sell thing for, things from baby oil to ammunition and cigarettes, uh, you know, to health food. So there are some really overly powerful things. And of course, probably the most dangerous thing out there is chlorine bleach. And even though it's 5.25% oh. or 6%, if you mix it with your vinegar uh, to clean, and, and many women do this, they're cleaning with, uh, they're cleaning with, with vinegar, and I mean, it's not working, so they add bleach to it to soup it up, and they're dead. They, and they're in the paper uh, the next day because they were cleaning their bathroom, and the kids come home from school and found them dead uh, in the bathroom. So, yeah, you know, it, there are dangerous things that's or ammonia. Yeah. Ammonia. Yeah. It, yeah. And so, what it comes down to is we are all in agreement that these household over the counter cleaners for our customers is not appropriate. And why they shouldn't buy it. But what should we, how can we advise them to buy something? Let's say you're a carpet cleaner and you don't have anything. What would you suggest? Thomas, you have your hand up. Well, there are things like Polux that are very relatively safe anyway. But the one thing I think we've missed in all this is if we're using these products and we're leaving them on the carpet, you know, they all just about say test in an inconspicuous area. And they used to all say rinse thoroughly after use. Mm -hmm. Well, they've taken that out today for the most part on many of the labels. And the reason they do that is because it causes rapid resoiling. And what do you do if, uh, if the XYZ product got out the spot the first time and it comes back? What do you do? You go you buy more. more XYZ product. So they, it's a built-in thing where they want to sell you more product. If they're going to use anything... The most important thing is when they are finished to rinse the chemical out of the carpet that they're using. And actually, first and last out, they should use water first and then the product and then water again. It should be ABA. Water, whatever the product is, and then water. And that's just my opinion. No, I, I, I agree with you. You should encourage your customers to use water. I leave them with a bottle of all of my customers that are over three hundred dollars, I leave them with a bottle of Ultra Dry. It's just a general purpose, all around hit win product. You can get it from Paul at Kim Max. I know it's not a gray matter chemistry product, but Paul's my friend and he's my buddy. So buy his spotters. It actually works really darn good. It's really safe for your customers, and it works. I mean, I always swear that if if you wanted to do a spotting contest, hand me a bottle of Ultra Dry and I'll win. <laughs> okay, well, that's going to be at uh, Cleaners Fest. There you go. 27th to 28th, there will be a spotting championship. So you bring it, and we'll see how it works. Oh, absolutely. Let's try I, it. I mean, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm saying let's try it and see. No, you know? we got, I want everybody to see what that's capable of. And, you know, yeah, we that's try okay. and Now, so, you know, we actually go only chest spot removal. We're actually going to check and make sure there's no delamination and stuff. Because we had absolutely. a guy – Tony Brevik, who uh, brought T111 and poured it on the rug, and he was the fastest spot remover on the planet. <laughs> but you can feel the primary and secondary backing apart without any pressure whatsoever. So Paul and, had his hand up. I think do not work either. Go ahead, Paul. I think Paul wants to talk about Cleaners Fest a little bit and his experience there. Well, all I wanted to say is I, I think it would be wise as a cleaning company uh, for you to – uh, have some suggestions uh, to give your customer because they're looking at you as being, uh, you know, the the expert. And so uh, even though we're not in a retail business, 
-hmm. And I know some people hate retail, so they, they don't want to hear this or do it. You know, they might hear it, but they, they won't do it. But it's not a bad idea to have a, a spotter that you like and trust and know uh, that you can get your name put on it, either a, a sticker that you can put on it that looks professional or have a company private label it for you and have your your company spotter. Now, you want to make sure that you're, you're giving something out that is worthwhile and doesn't cause these problems we were just talking about. Not too strong, no, you know, no soil attracting uh, issues, uh, you know, no sticky residue type product, but something that you're confident in. And many of the companies out there uh, will give you uh, access to these private label or, or you can have, you know, I, I'm thinking like Perky Spotter is one that's pretty common. And that's not a bad idea. Uh, some companies even have a little spotting kit uh, that they hand out or give. And, of course, either they make it themselves, which is probably not a good idea because of labeling laws. But, right. you know, purchase them uh, from a company in small sizes and then uh, either give them to a high-paying customer or a loyal customer, high-ticket customer, or sell them. Uh, to people. So um, that's probably not a bad idea. That's a whole nother subject, of course. But I, I would encourage that. I know many years ago when I did clean carpet, I had a welcome wagon uh, lady. Um, in fact, I had a couple of them that when people would buy real estate, they would go there and they'd have a, a, a bunch of gifts to give. And one of the gifts they gave was one of our spotters with our name and phone number on it. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I paid for that, but uh, that was the same bottle we left with people that spent over a certain amount. I think it was over $200. We just gave them one. And if they were under that, we would we would offer to sell them one. So anyway. Absolutely. Well, and, and something we do with our janitorial and custodials, I have Thunder. It's listed as Thunder. And I because I have the rights to do it. I, I mix it up in a little spray bottle and it's at every one of our janitorial places. And we, but the label has to be, um, with your laws. You can't just throw a generic label on it. You have to have the reference to the SDS and any compliance numbers that you have to have any other information like poison control has to be on there. So when you're making your spotter really ask some questions, don't get I can't yourself just use a people. Sharpie. I can't just okay, write time under to move on to the next subject where Kevin won't be so worked up. So <laughs> oh my goodness, we're just gonna we're just gonna use a sharpie on everything. Okay, uh, Robert, I didn't see your hand up. Robert, Tip, uh, Paul, if you could message me your number um, I, I, on, on this subject in particular with spotters. I agree with Paul with, Paul, with everything Paul just said. So. Um, we all have our local distributors. Mine just happens to be John Don. Um, John Don does have a program where they will they will take your logo, your phone number, and everything, and put it on. You can do six ounce, twelve ounce, one quart bottles. Um, I do a one quart bottle for all my for all my commercial clients. Give them a little education on how to do what they want. I also agree with Paul on the ABA water, water chemical, water flush it. Educate them on how to do it. And if it's something that needs to be done, you can't get to them. Talk mm -hmm. to them, talk it through, through them on the phone, and then get them on a schedule, get it taken care of. But always, always, always leave that spotter with them. I put mine, I actually do two things. I put mine inside of a coffee cup, a coffee cup, plastic wrap coffee cup with the spotter inside of it. They put the spotter on their shelf and the coffee cup is on their desk. Anytime they hit, see anything with cleaning related, it's the coffee cup on their desk. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do the same thing. I give them a coffee cup with a bottle of gin in it or um, rum. Um, anyways, I'm joking. Bourbon. <laughs> Bourbon. Bourbon. It's got to be good. Bourbon. Okay. So now it's time to move on to our business. So we're going to be talking about the subject tonight about grout and color seal in that whole fun nine yards. So we're first going to cover the first part. If you can clean grout properly and get good results, it's best not just to throw down a sealant. If the car, if the grout is in good repair, it's better to clean it. I'm first going to show a video of uh, some different techniques of cleaning grout. 
Um, simple. You don't have to have a spinner. Don't think you do. I'm first going to start with one of the videos. This is when we were testing. Um, we were in the process of testing lightning. It was in the prototyping stage, and I sent Kevin out as one of our testers. Um, All right, Mr. Eater. And everybody watching, this is lightning. This is tile and grout in an ER waiting room hallway. It's pretty dirty. You gonna let me down, Tim? Or is lightning as good as you say it is? Yep, let's find out. Holy crap. Hmm. Well, there's the mud. CRV, no high pressure water, which is what I've always used. Winter, winter, chicken dinner. I like it. So that's when we were first testing out lightning and developing it. And this is another video of when we were developing lightning. Now, normally I would have given that a little bit more dwell time, but I did it for dramatic effect. Um, when we when we were working on that product, we wanted to make something that doesn't require a lot of pressure, a lot of heat, or anything like that, and it works really well. I asked Paul to put a lot of oxygen in it, and he did a great job. It's a good all-purpose um, tile and grout cleaner. So now that we've covered how to, like, I don't like using high pressure myself. I find it to blow out a lot of grout lines. I really am in love with the brush glide. I think it does a terrific job cleaning tile and grout. And I love the CRB on tile and grout. Um, but then we get to the, the fact. And, you know, um, the fact is, is some, some grout can't be fixed. I mean, it's gotten absorbed. It's absorbed the soil. It's absorbed the grease. You can't fix it. You can't make it better. And, um, Let's throw up one of those photos, Aaron, the first one that you had, uh, uh, that Jim did. And it'll show the different phases. This, this photo that we'll throw up will show the different phases of um, tile and grout cleaning. So if you can see there, um, obviously Jim had a really dirty floor. And then as he went through the different phases, he can walk us through some of those different steps. Um, Jim, so how, what makes you decide whether to color seal or not? Well, I mean, I went out to this one first uh, to check it out and to do the estimate um, and just looking at it and then talking with the customer, knowing that it hadn't been properly cleaned or sealed and seeing that under certain areas, it was a very, very white um, grout, but then it had that yellow staining to it, especially in the area that you're looking at. This is actually, um, this was a really high end home. So that was two washers and two dryers right there. So we knew with the green from the mineral buildup and things like that, that there was no way we were going to get this back to normal easily. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I can see a pretty dramatic effect. Um, and, you know, so, so basically it looks like you cleaned the floor thoroughly. That's the first yeah. step, right? Absolutely. And then the second, what is your second step? Is it doing any repair that's necessary then? This one specifically didn't need repair, but yeah, at that point um, we would do, grout repair if needed um mm -hmm. fortunately uh this floor all the grout was intact uh, except for a couple areas over by the kitchen where the previous homeowners decided to use silicone <laughs> in the grout line but she didn't want us to touch it because they just had their wood floors done so they didn't want anything to be uh to da be damaged at that point oh but, yeah i mean if, yeah oh, that's painful. <laughs> it's silicone that is so painful that is yeah. So, <laughs> so, so we were actually really lucky with, uh, with this one, not having to be, 
um, repaired because of the amount of time that it took with moving these high-end washer and dryers and disconnecting these gas lines and things like that. Uh, the whole process took us five and a half hours, but the main, once we got the outside done with this stuff, the middle only took two and a half. Mm -hmm. Now, um, now I'm going to show a video of you actually completing the ceiling and, and how you went about doing it. Now, I have to admit, you make that look awful easy. Is it really that easy? Uh, yes. Now, let me point out, too, that I was not sent the proper bottles. That was a Walmart uh, airplane bottle. I do not recommend those by any means. They drip around the seals, and they make a huge mess. Uh, but it really is that easy as long as you get the right brush in there. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very, very simple. Now, as far as pricing, what's your recommendation on pricing? I'm still working this out. Um, so I would like to say that for the color seal itself, I'm going to be <coughs> right in like the $3 a square foot range, um, depending on the job. The one on the left there was quite a bit tougher because there was grout lines all in the corner. They actually had tile coming up the wall. Uh, so the, all the edges were grouted, which made it uh, extremely difficult on that specific one. The one on the right side was different bigger outlines weren't really running up the walls. You just had the ones on the edge by the baseboard. So that one was a lot, a lot easier to do. That one only took me about 30 minutes to do the whole thing. Yeah. That that's actually real impressive. Um, now, as far as picking colors, do you show the customer colors that you have available? Or are you making the, the decision on what color to use? Uh, these two specifically, I do bring the stuff full or the swatch that I have with me. Um, and then six, uh, six of the main colors that, that are used, um, on the one on the left, she just said, I want to go gray with the customer on the right. Uh, we found a little pantry closet and we tested out three different colors. Uh, yeah. one, one was a white and then, uh, we went with the, the gray that we actually did. And then one of them was a darker color. That's pretty awesome. So do you, um, are you able to color match just about anything with your process or do you not bother and you just tell them what you're going to, what you want them to have? No, I give them, um, I give them the opportunity to pick what they want. I do kind of let them know, you know, Hey, on some, you know, a lot of people want to get as close to the color of the tile as possible. That way it looks like one smooth floor, but other people like to match, you know, what's around it, your countertops, your cabinets and things like that to make it pop more. So I'll absolutely let them, I, I tell my customers, you know, I'll order up to three different colors other than what I have because I'm going to, I know I'm going to use it somewhere. Um, yeah. And, you know, if I don't have it and then we'll test them out for you. That's pretty awesome, man. And, um, you know, so, so you've had, have you had mostly positive experiences using color seal? Have you had any to do any repairs when it comes to doing color seal, like repair other people's damage? Uh, I've, I have had to repair other people's damage with um, the color seals that were bought at the big box stores, Home Depot, Lowe's, places like that. Yeah, it's a bit of a pain in the butt. We'll talk about that briefly in a little bit. Um, so basically, um, Jim's had a lot of success with it. Um, Robert, you had some things you wanted to share with us. Um, Aaron, you want to throw up the – oh, well, that's still Jim's picture. There we go. There's Robert's picture. So, Robert. What do we got going here? So this is this this job in particular right here. Um, this is kind of, uh, kind of ironic. I'm in another Hampton property right now as we're speaking in um, I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana right now. But this one in particular was in Dallas. Uh, this was a two and a half year old building um, in the bathrooms on the on the picture on the left. Aaron, can you possibly blow that up a little bit? The one with you can see um, on the install itself, there was a lot of there's there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, there's real thin grout. They have real thin grout lines where they wipe too much out. Um, there was a significant difference in 
Um, in that bathroom in particular, from one side of the room to the other, there was probably three different shades of grout where they mixed small batches at a time. And each time they mixed it, it was in a different, it was, they mixed it different. So when it dried, it was all kinds of, all kinds of disc discolored. Um, so what we did here, um, in, 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 when you get into the hospitality field, when you get into hospitals, uh, specifically in hospitality hotels, Hilton, Marriott, Best Western, IHG, um, when these buildings are built or when they go through a remodel, all of the colors, all of the tile, all of the grout, all of that stuff is picked out by corporate and the ownership has three different choices of what they use. So when corporate comes in and they do it, uh, the one I'm at right now, um, they have specific color codes for the grout. So we can take that color code and send it off and have the grout color seal matched with that color code. So that when we come back in and we color seal from one side to the other, it's all uniform across. A yeah. lot of people don't realize when you get into corporate situation they don't really care if it's uniformly dirty or uniformly clean as long as it's consistently uniform okay that you makes total different. sense so that's where and where i'm at right now in new orleans new orleans this is a two-year-old building and i sent a picture to you earlier it, it's the exact same thing oh aaron will you go ahead and throw up that next picture of Roberts right there. And you can actually oh, you can see actually where see. they're missing grout in places. No, like, no, no. That's, that's, that's not missing grout. That's where that's um, soil. grout from the brown. See where the brown tile is and the white tile is. There's a darker brown color grout. And on the white tile, that's a white grout. And mm -hmm. when they grouted it, they just let the brown overlap onto the white and just wiped it off and left it. Wow, that is that is laziness, is what that is. That, that, so, well, it's laziness, but we're here to fix it. So Mark Morris actually has a great question for us right here, and it's what's your opinion on color seal on slab? Um, is there a moisture uh, vapor transmission concern to you? Well, it everything needs taken into consideration. If you have an effervescence issue already in the grout, so you're noticing white hazing and effervescence and water transmission up through the grout, absolutely I'll take that in consideration. But if I'm looking at something like what Robert's dealing with here, what option do you have for the customer? I mean, Kevin and I are going to talk a little bit about removing color seal. And I've had to remove color seal. And this is my tool of choice with a carbide blade in it. I'll put a carbide blade in it and I'll sand and grind it out or I'll use a little hand tool and I'll just be like, sand it out because you got to grind it out. But as far as my <clears throat> concerns with uh, moisture and stuff, sure, it, it can be a concern. Like you wouldn't necessarily want to do it with an improperly cared for slab. Let's say it's a, it's a short slab or, you know, there's places in the country that have a, not a six inch slab, it's a four inch slab. And that that could have moisture intrusion. Absolutely, it could. It could be a concern, but I'm not overly freaking out about it. Like in that hotel, it may be on slab. Um, Robert, you had your hand up. So to answer that question, what, what option do we have? So this is the situation that I am in right now, right here. Um, corporate came in and did an inspection two weeks ago um, they knocked the franchise owner 2,500 points on their corporate inspection and gave them 90 days to fix it. And when they say fix it, they mean either patch, fix the grout or cut the tile out and replace it. They have yeah. 90 days to make that decision. So in these situations, you're kind of put in when you're looking at, you know, this is probably... I'm going to ballpark here, probably somewhere in the area of 1.2 to 1.3 million dollars worth of tile and grout here. Absolutely. This is and not. I a, don't. Not a, a an easy situation for that owner to be in. It's not my situation, but what do you do? Do we go through and fix it, or do we we cut it out and replace it? And you know, you can have a moisture issue. Let's say you just use a turbo hybrid on the floor, and it's a porous surface and it's sanded grout, now you have moisture in that tile, 
you need to let it dry for a while. I mean, it needs to be nice and rock solid dry. It might be a three, four day process. And so, yeah, moisture, transmission, vapor, that can be a concern, sure. But you also have to do what's right by your customer. And so that's making take, a pretty floor. We take a floor and each floor is usually typically anywhere from 25 to 35 rooms on a floor. That floor is done for six days. Mm -hmm. It's out of commission for six days. So now we have to do the fair thing and let Kevin say what Kevin's thinking because his eyes. Yes. Uh-oh, here it comes. How do you like color seal, Kevin? Get it, Kevin. Well, how do I say this nicely? I hate it. Um, <laughs> but let me let me preface that by saying there there certainly is always a time for everything. There's time and place for everything. And I've been racking my brain, and there's there's a specific reason I hate color ceiling, and I can't remember the name of the company. Um. Maybe when you guys remember, it was like late 90s, early 2000s. This stuff was super popular and everybody was color ceiling. It was on it. it was on TV, the as seen on TV products. No, it was a uh, I don't want to say grout master. It was it was some brand and they were selling everybody on ceiling, resealing color and grout. And grout I pulled perfect. so huh? Grout perfect. No, it was a. No. I, I'll think of it. Soon. I'll think of it as soon as we're we're done. But anyway, I the stuff pulled, that would peel off in long strips, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was. It was, it was always chipping up, and it wrong. yeah, right. So I fixed so much of that that and and not fixed it. Like you said, you got some of that stuff you have to cut out. Um, I've always been the biggest proponent of cleaning because. And, and if I can't get it clean, I need to figure out why. And that's where all the different chemicals that I've used over the years. Because I remember when we used to clean tile and grout in the 90s, it was all acid. That's all you used. Oh, yeah. You, you, you flooded everything with acid and that was the way to do it. And then we figured out, oh, well, we're just removing the grout. So that's not really the best way to do it. Then it went high alkaline. Hey, that's great. And then the high pressure came out. My first high pressure machine was a King Cobra. Loved it. Good unit. You know, we, we used the heck out of that thing. But again, there was so much of it that was overused. And instead of properly cleaning the floor and prepping the floor, they would just throw this stuff on top of it. And then in two a year, two, three, all this stuff is chipping off and it looks horrible. And then somebody else comes in and we would look at it, try to clean it. And we're like, yeah, we can't because... The areas that it's chipped off, obviously it didn't adhere. You know, you can't paint a moldy board. And that's essentially what they were trying to do. Yeah. Um, it was really, really fun under the urinals because nobody ever cleaned those right. And so it was just two, six, 12 different colors, whatever it would end up being. Um, but then the other areas that were fairly clean, corners, edges, then you couldn't get it off. You know, so I've never been a huge proponent of it, again, mainly from the standpoint that it get it got overused so much. Just, you know, honestly, it's kind of like bonneting in the 90s. Everybody yeah. started throwing a cotton bonnet on the bottom of their floor machine. Look, we're cleaning carpet. And they had no idea. You know, that's the years of dipping the, the bonnet in a mop Grabbing bucket. Grabbing the butyl base, yeah. the greaser, throwing a bonnet under the floor machine and spinning that dirt. And I can't tell you how much deep action from Hilliard we went through. But, you know, you just pour it in the mop bucket and you dipped it in there and you wrung it out and you threw this big soppy bonnet on the floor and you, you know, so it, it got overused and it didn't get used correctly. So then it got a bad name. And then, you know, so now here we are. Obviously, VLM is a big thing and a lot of stuff has changed. So it certainly can be an option. I like to think of it as the last resort option. And then be sure that you set your customers' expectations that yeah, this may not be permanent. This is not a force field for dirt. And that's honestly why I even stopped impregnating grout. We never really <laughs> did much ceiling. We did it all impregnator. And the problem was is that no matter how we explained it, I, I don't know why. I would go into great detail about what this product was and what it wasn't. Every customer thought it was a force field for dirt. That their grout would never get dirty again. 
they almost customers almost think like there is a, a knight in shining armor there that's going to come and take people's shoes off and wash their bare feet before they walk in the door when you use these type of products and really these products and th- this is brass tacks. I mean, I, I don't, I know it offends people, but it really is a band aid for a problem. But sometimes band aids are your best and only option. Well, it's the same and, with any protector, too, though. Absolutely. People think mm-hmm. that dirt's going to hover above the carpet magically yep. and they don't have to do anything. Exactly. And, and that's yeah. one of the biggest problems with it is they don't, no matter how much, like Kevin said, he would go into great detail explaining what it will and won't do. Same with protectors of on, on fabrics, whether it's upholstery, carpet, uh, whatever. It, you explain, you explain, you explain. The customer has selective hearing. They hear what they want to hear, and then they have unrealistic expectations. Yeah, and so I want to do something that's kind of mean, but I'm going to do it to each and every one of you so you better tolerate it because I'm the host. Bring it. Okay, here. I'm going to first ask the question, is it a legitimate repair or is it a temporary patch? Temporary patch. Kevin, temporary patch. Okay, Paul, well, how do you feel? Well, I don't, I'm not really into that part of the business as far as uh, doing uh, tile and grout cleaning. So I, I don't really have a lot of experience with it. We've sold some of it. I have some of my customers that do quite a bit of it. Uh, and they seem to... Uh, you have found the products that they like and they usually have a guy or two that really is good at it, but yeah. not everybody's good at it. So I, I have a very limited um, experience, but what I do know is I get phone calls when things don't work. So I hear about the, the stuff that doesn't stick, the stuff that breaks off and peels off. Uh, and then I also hear about people that use like urethane and, way, way too difficult to remove. And then they get a yellowing and discoloration. So my, my only advice to somebody would be, you know, pick a reputable company that specializes in this, you know, take mm-hmm. a class on it, you know, and get to know your stuff before you start promoting something. Absolutely. So Jim, do you think it's a legitimate repair or just a patch? I, I mean, I think that these guys hit the nail on the head with it. It really is dependent on what you use. Um, so I tested it the other day. I really wanted to know what's – I used the turbo seal. I wanted to know what it was going to do. So after I cleaned out underneath the washer and dryers and I pushed those back, I had about three feet there. We let that dry for about 20 minutes, and I popped the spinner up to 1,000 PSI and went over it and wasn't missing a spot. Now, again, it, it's going to depend on how the customers take care of their floors, too. I mean, you can't Absolutely. just not have maintenance. Yeah, and, and and so you're on the legitimate repair side then. Um, Thomas, legitimate repair or patch? Well, it depends on how it's done. And the biggest thing is, is twofold. Number one, it's the prep of the floor before it's applied. That is a yes. key. And two, there are paints and there are stains that actually impregnate and penetrate through, and that's the difference. I've only been doing this for about 30 years or so now, so I've seen so many failures. It's it's horrific, the things I've seen as failures, but I've seen some people that did a really great job prepping it and then doing it, and it lasted for – I've got one customer here we did – over 10 years ago and it still looks good and she still talks about every time i go to clean her carpet my kitchen still looks good and i can't believe it but you know we went through a meticulous process we did investigate the product we were using we did clean thoroughly we did dry really really well before application and did everything right so it can be either one do you want a quick fix go buy the stuff from the box store yeah, okay. or or go get some, grab some color. You know, I can go to the hardware store and get the little pints of paint. You know, and I, I I can make the grout look pretty. But if you want it lasting, you really need to hire someone who knows. Their- I have a customer that used um, deck stain, <laughs> and it worked. Right, <laughs> it, it it's still in their kitchen. It's still in their kitchen, and because that is the color of their grout paint. 
It I mean, it's only a, a dumb idea if it doesn't work, right? It worked. Yeah. That's how it I've, worked. That's how I've lived um, my life. People have told me a long time that was a stupid idea. I'm like, it worked, didn't it? How it worked. Dumb worked? Good. Like, it, worked. it works in the last three years. Hey. Remember, fame, not pain. A match can come start a, a campfire, so can an acetylene torch and napalm. Everybody has their own style. Um, Robert. Is it a real uh, fix or is it a temporary? Uh, I mean, there's 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 nothing there's nothing permanent. I love that statement. There's there's truthful. there's nothing permanent. So, uh, truthful, all, all, all honesty. If I had some bad installs, yes, I have. I've had mm-hmm. some. Ba- I've had some bad installs. I've, I've personally done some bad installs, but I learned from each and every one of those. So, what it comes down to is, like like Thomas said. The, the biggest thing for me, the more the more that I do it and the more successful that I am becoming with this particular brand is the preparation, the yes. cleaning to begin with, the cleaning the floor with an acid, neutralizing it with an alkaline, letting it dry 24 hours with blowers on it before you apply anything to it. Make sure it's good, and clean, make sure it's good and dry and then take your time. You're charging accordingly for your time. Why are you rushing? I agree. I, it's if, now. Let me, let me rephrase that. If yeah. you are charging accordingly. There you go. Time. That That's correct. And it so now be, it's time. It can be either. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to share my thoughts on it. I consider it to be neither. It's not legitimate. It's not a legitimate repair. And it's not a hack either. It's kind of like taking your car to Mako. <laughs> That's what Color Seal is. I have a 1984 Taurus, and it looks terrible. I don't want it to look bad no more. But I don't want the dealership to repaint this car and fix all the rust and fix it properly. Because the truth is, grinding out all the grout and changing it to the color is the ideal repair. Customers don't care. They want it to look better. And a 1984 Taurus isn't going to have a lot of life left in it. Nobody wants that car in the first place. But if you so take it, it to make life it, when it was new, <laughs> nobody wanted it. When it well, <laughs> SHO Taurus in '84, you were 94. You were cool. You were cool. Well, if, yeah. If you had a show, for yeah, but I mean, how, come many, on. how many people had that? Like twelve. Tim. Tim. Really. Yes. You were cool with a '94 SHO. It, Actually, the only way you would be any cooler is if you had really? a Ford probe. <laughs> Nobody was cool in a probe, man. Not even when they were watching Fast and Furious. Oh my goodness, we could do an entire an entire um, episode just on the cars we grew up with. I had a ND500 edition um, lowered and full body kit Grand Am. That was my my car in '94. And it had a, it was the biggest engine available and all that. It was actually a quick little turd of a car. It was fun, fun, quick fun, turd. fun car. Um, so, but anyways, as I said, I think of it kind of like taking your car to Mako to get it repainted. It, it, it's sufficient. It works. Sometimes does it give you an issue? Sure. Sometimes is it great? Absolutely. I've seen show cars that were painted at Mako. It really has to come down to is the person doing the work. The person doing the work is the one that's going to determine whether this turns out good or not. So we got some questions from the audience. Um, Where's a good source to learning about the science of grout? Well, um, that's the hard surface class that um, Brian Thompson and Mike Peliote has every year. They have an excellent class. I've attended that. And I thought it was just incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible class. They stew in them. They they, they share with you more information than your brain can absorb in the three days. And then they give you a book at the end of it. And that book is just incredible. Um, there's other classes. I'm sure Thomas can help us figure out what other classes there may be available. Um, reach out to instructors, um, of course. Um, same question, essentially. Um, I, I would say the, the upcoming class... Um, with, with Mike before the experience. I mean, that's the one to take in, in October. Um, see, 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 somebody agrees with me that the show wasn't the worst car. 
See, it had a Yamaha. I mean, Yamaha. Come on, guys. Don't pick on me no more. I, make me Jim, cry. Before that statement, your respect level was here. Uh huh. Or it's about here. <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember my generation, we, we rolled with Ice Ice Baby, man. Hey, like, I, am your, ice I am your was, generation, sir. I know. I know. I, I know. I, I realize that, but you've moved on. I haven't. I'm still living in the past. <laughs> Hmm. I so bet I would be the happiest man ever if, if somebody had rolled up in their 5.0 and took me off into the sunset. Um, anyways, guys, I think that that wraps things up for tonight. I want to thank everybody for watching tonight. I don't see any other questions in here. I think we got them all other than Cody likes lightning. Cody's my man. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Once again, as always, just think it through. And here's a little teaser toward things that are yet to come.